Chaos Workshop all week. Uh, it's it's been great. Uh, let's let's take a quick look about at, over you know what we've gone over, what we've learned. Um, but then we have a bit of a surprise for you because today we're going to depart from the workshop just a little bit, and we're actually going to uh, talk about uh, I think a pretty fun topic. It's a day two topic, and we'll even explain a little bit about what day two means. So. Let's review real quick. What have we learned? Uh, we went through eksworkshop.com. And by the way, if you if you missed the show, definitely go check out our videos uh, from earlier this week. And uh, also check out eksworkshop.com. We went over the introduction on day one, and we just talked about what are the mechanics of Kubernetes? Why do you want container orchestration? Uh, what does it do for you? And stuff like that. Uh, day two, we actually built our cluster, um, and then we deployed our first application. Uh, and our first application was super basic. It was the Kubernetes dashboard. Um, so uh, you can definitely follow along in that video and, and get your own uh, dashboard deployed um, when you're ready. Then we also deployed the example microservices. We've been using these a lot. I think they're pretty fun to use. It's just slightly better than a hello world application because it's a it's two tiers of applications. We have a front end microservice that's written in Rails, and then we have a back end, two back ends. One of them written in Node.js, one of them written in Crystal, and it helps us illustrate a lot of different things. One, uh, the polyglot nature that you get uh, by using containers. You can run anything in containers, so you don't have to be limited to a single language. And then two, uh, the ability to have this uh, sort of backend service that's addressable only inside the cluster. So that way you don't have to think about, you know, how do I get traffic into it? Uh, because the only thing that's ever going to talk to these backend services is the front end service. And I'm sure you have that in your in your environment, too. So we talked about the difference uh, or how to set up that kind of service. And then how that differs from the front end service. The front end service uses a load balancer to get traffic into it. Yesterday, uh, you know, we we deployed the same applications again, um, but this time we did it using something that I'd say is probably a little bit more uh, production worthy, and that is we used Helm and we templated those uh, those cluster configurations. Uh, those deployment configurations. And that allowed us to, uh, you know, like alter what image uh, gets pushed out, alter the count of the of the services so that we had more than one pod running. And it made it really, really simple to, to roll that out. And we talked about how, you know, templating is really what you're going to need once you start deploying either to multiple clusters or to multiple environments. So multiple environments might be development, staging, production. Multiple clusters might be uh, your laptop, uh, you know, a QA environment, and then production. So there's all kinds of uh, possibilities. One of the things that we talked about, though, uh, way back, I think on Monday, was just how, how EKS is so useful when it comes to uh, not having to manage the control plane. And for me, the best way to illustrate that is to talk about the upgrade process. So today, what I want us to go through is I want us to go through an upgrade. Now, if you think about the installation process, you think about getting everything up and running, getting your applications deployed, um, we call that day one. So that's all, you know, that has one uh, level of difficulty, right? It's it once you've achieved that accomplishment, a lot of times you sit back and you say, okay, oh, that's I feel good, right? Um, well, then there's day two. And what does that really mean? So you can rock along day one, you know, for quite some time. And in fact, at Amazon, we we like to actually say it's always day one. Um, or is it it's still day one? Uh, anyway, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Close enough. But day two, what does that really mean? That means 
once you have to you know go through the upgrade process or fix something that's broken or figure out how to scale up um, these are all day two type uh, functions and we want to make sure that that one it you know it's easy on our service but two uh, that's the kind of heavy lifting that we're trying to alleviate you from we want to make sure that you don't have to worry about uh, all of those day two problems. You can focus on the day two problems that might be part of your application. Um, focus on your application without having to focus on the infrastructure. So if you were running your own DIY cluster, you would own the control plane. So when the next version of Kubernetes comes out, you have to upgrade it. Um, so what do you have to do when you're upgrading the control plane? I was just going to ask that myself is like maybe walk through that because that's a lot of work, right? It is. Yeah. So, you know, there's a couple of, uh, a couple of directions you can take, uh, for a long time, the recommendation was just build a whole new cluster <laughs> and then cut, you know, bring up your applications on that new cluster and then cut traffic over to it. That was a useful app. That was a useful recommendation back when everyone was limiting themselves to running ephemeral applications, you know, because, hey, yeah, bring up new APIs. It's totally fine. Uh, but now so many people are running stateful workloads. They need to figure out, well, how do I get all my data over to the new cluster? So uh, an upgrade in place is the other option. And how do you do an upgrade in place? Well, luckily, the Kubernetes API uh, has a notion of being backwards compatible. So as long as you're going from one version to the next version, uh, you can actually upgrade one node at a time and roll through all of your control plane nodes until they're all upgraded. And they'll still be able to communicate with each other and go healthy. Uh, but that's something that you'll have to manage and do. Then once you've done that, you have to roll through uh, your worker nodes and replace all of those. So how does EKS make that easier? Well, I actually thought, you know, how can I show you? So what I've done is I've actually set up, uh, let's see here. First, let's take a look at, at what we have. Um, I have a cluster here called, um, I have a couple of clusters to demo with. Demo control plane upgrade. And you'll notice back on the main page here, you see the Kubernetes version is, is one of the only bits of information. We have name, version, and, and uh, whether it's active or not. And you can see that demo control plane upgrade is behind a version and it's ready to be upgraded. So I can actually initiate the upgrade from here. I'm not going to, but I can. And then I did already upgrade this one, and you'll notice that it gives me a little notice uh, that there's a new AMI release for one of the node groups. So I can totally, uh, you know, take note of that and address that as well. So we're going to walk through all of that. Urban Blaster says, I love Fargate. Me do too. Yeah, and me too. Man, I can tell you this is one area that, you know, we definitely, if you use Fargate, upgrading is even easier because uh, we're going to go through the control plane and then the data plane. There's no upgrading with Fargate, right? So once you've done uh, the control plane, you're done. Uh, there's nothing more to, to worry about. So what do we have to do? Let's just talk through it at a high level. Adam, what do you think we need to do? Well, so are we talking from start to finish here? I mean, first of all, we need to upgrade that con the control plane, yeah. Right, and then once we upgrade our control plane, we then need to think about our our what we call the the data plane. Right? Yeah. So that's our node groups. So then we need to upgrade our node groups, cycle instances, bring in the yep. new instances to the node groups, um, and then, you know, we're we're feeling pretty good. But yeah, you know, that's just yeah. high level. So let's 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 get into that's totally right. By the way, so good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Remember, as I said, when I get put off the spot, I, I freeze. So. Uh huh. Yeah. No, that's cool. You get to keep your job. It's all good. 
Thank you. Um, so let's uh, let's actually deploy some work uh, to the to this cluster, and uh, then we'll go from there. So again, this isn't in the workshop. Uh, so this is kind of just we're going with the flow. We're seeing what happens. We'll probably make some mistakes along the way, and we'll have to figure it out. Uh, don't worry about it. And as long as uh, we don't, you know, kill our cluster, I think we're gonna we're gonna come out of this on the other side uh, better off. So we'll learn from any mistakes that we make. Okay, so let's look at the situation as we have it right now. Uh, if I do cube control get nodes, I have a cluster where I'm looking at 115 uh, nodes. In fact, let me just look real quick. I created a cluster demo control plane upgrade and brought it up. It is running 115 and its name is demo control plane upgrade. And that should correspond with what we see here. Demo control plane upgrade is ready to be upgraded. So what do we have to do to initiate that upgrade? Again, I can click the button in the console or I can use EKS control. So I'm gonna do that. EKS control upgrade cluster name is demo control plane upgrade enter. Now, this is one cool thing about EKS control that I really like. Uh, for some of the slightly more intrusive actions, like initiating a change that you can't undo, um, it wants you to pass in an approve option. So this is a dry run. It's showing me what will happen. Um, the plan is to upgrade demo control plane from current version 115 to 160. And everything appears that it, it will work correctly. So I'm gonna do dash dash approve. Done. I mean, it's not done done, but it has, it has begun. And if we go back over to our console and hit refresh, we see now it's updating. Cool. It's pretty fantastic. I mean, that's pretty great. And if we were to go look at CloudFormation, by the way, let's just check real quick. Um, you know how EKS Control uses CloudFormation to generate or to build the cluster. There's no CloudFormation update happening here. So EKS Control does more than just cloud, uh, CloudFormation. It actually also makes an API call into the EKS API. So that's how the, the upgrade is initiated, is by uh, an API call. Um, now we're going to just let this one go. Uh, it's not going to probably finish. Maybe it'll be finished by the end of the show, but um, we're going to go ahead and move on and we're going to make use of test upgrade uh, from this point forward. So we'll leave this running in the in this window and we'll move over to here. I built a second cluster and I've already run upgrade cluster. This one is for test upgrade. I did approve. And you see the same output here. We'll upgrade cluster uh, from 115 to 116. And it says has been upgraded to version 116. And now we're ready to move on to the next step. So this particular cluster has node groups that are still 115, but the but the control plane is 116. So the next step. Upgrade node groups. Before we do, let's explore a little bit and let's see, um, since I'm dealing with multiple clusters, let's just make sure that I have the right config written. So cube control. Get. Do you want to explain what you just did right there? Because I think that's a really cool command. That's true, yeah. So I have my one cloud nine is a client and has cube control installed, but which cluster is it pointing to? Um, you know, the fact is, I don't even remember. And so just to make sure before I start firing off commands to a cluster, I told EKS control to write me a new cube config and uh, tie it to the cluster test upgrade. 
there are other ways you can do this. There's all kinds of like context tools and, and multiple cube configs that you can manage and all that kind of stuff. But for me, this command is the simplest because I, I know I can always run it. And whether I have any cube config working or not, this will make sure that it works for me and that it's tied to the correct cluster. Yeah, that's cool. So, so now when I do get nodes, I know I'm talking to the correct cluster. If I do uh, get cluster info, uh, I can't remember what is. Cluster role isn't going to tell me. I don't remember what the info, there's an info thing, but I always do write cube config and that way I know I'm dealing with the correct cluster. Okay, so the next thing that we have to do, oh, before actually I said work needs to be running. So let's actually deploy our services again. And remember we did this with Helm before. Uh, so Helm install workshop. Ooh, maybe it's already running. Uh, cube control get services. Oh, it is. Good. So let's just check. Let's pull this up. There's our load balancer address. Yeah, great. So our sample application is up and running already. Cube control cluster info. Let's just run that real quick. Thank you. Uh, I... On, I don't know how you say the name. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> just, just thank you. It's, it's, it gets tough. Sweet. Cluster info dump, I believe, is where I can find the name. Somewhere in there is the name of my cluster. Um, now I regret running that. It's OK. <laughs> I think we can uh, move on. Yeah, totally. We know we're not, we know we're talking to the right cluster. All right, so I have my services running. It's all good. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to stop that. So we'll just let that continue to run in the background. And in the meantime, we'll move on to the next uh, steps. Okay, so if I do uh, cube control get pods now. Normally, cube control get pods just shows me everything that's in the default namespace. But if you do dash in cube system, this is these are the pods that are running in the cube system namespace. Now, these are pods that are running out on my data plane, but in cube system. Cube system is the sort of Kubernetes uh, data plane uh, intelligence. Uh, namespace, so to speak. This is where all of the necessary Kubernetes stuff is running. So I have three daemon sets, AWS node, core DNS, and cube proxy. Well, these were all defined and executed and launched uh, under 115. You can imagine that 116 comes along and we need different daemon sets. We'll probably need different images and stuff like that. So what we want to do is make sure that we upgrade uh, all of these daemon sets also. And EKS control uh, actually will manage that for us as well. So if I do EKS control utils and explore uh, those possibilities, you'll see that there is update cube proxy, update AWS node, and update core DNS. So those are the things that I want to do. Uh, cube proxy is the more or less Kubernetes agent. Uh, AWS node is the AWS specific controller. And then core DNS is for managing DNS resolution. So let's do uh, EKS control utils, update cube proxy first. There's, I don't think there's any uh, specific order that we have to go in. We just need to do this next. And we're talking about the cluster named test upgrade. Cool. Oh, wait. 
dash remember dash dash approve so it's it's showing me hey it's not up to date because i upgraded from 115 to 116 so now it is up to date if i do uh get pods again we'll see cube proxy is starting to churn there's a new cube proxy running on one node it's been up for four seconds then it's moving on to the next node and it's still uh, creating the container and by now it should have uh, it rotated all of them so now we have the latest cube proxy let's do the same thing for uh aws node and again it's going to tell me use dash dash approve And while we're at it, we'll go ahead and do core DNS. And get pods. Let's just watch. So we see an AWS node is terminating. When you think about how easy that was, I mean, really, it's just you just issue a, a, a command, and in the background, it's initiating all of the uh, the replacement of those uh, images, which is fantastic. Exactly, and on top of that, notice my work is still processing. I'm still rocking along, serving out traffic. It's all good, right? So I didn't I didn't actually have any downtime. At least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, some AWS nodes that are uh, coming up now. One is running, so we'll end up rotating to the next uh, the next node. Let me just take off the watch, and we'll get a sort of current view of everything. So we have that one. Uh, recently, it's come up. It's not gone ready yet. So now it's ready, it's moving on to the third node, and it's about to replace that. And looking at the behavior here, I mean, you can see that this is clearly a service that um, it can't just all be killed at once, right? Yes. It needs to slowly cycle out. And the fact that it's handling that for us, and we don't have to do that on our own, again, just uh, ways of making this process easier. Like, it's really yeah. cool. Totally. Yeah, we we are able to just kind of sit back and we didn't have to think about it. We didn't have to figure out, OK, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm, I need to set a maintenance window and and rotate through one by one or any of that kind of stuff. It, everything is just taken care of for us. And because of the built in redundancies, we aren't having any kind of downtime. Yeah, and it, it reminds me of just any, you know, when you think about deploying a, a container to an orchestrator, whether it's Kubernetes, ECS, I have control over how I want my deployment to take place. You know, do I want to just replace all at once? Do I want to do a gradual deploy, a step deploy? So I, it's just really nice to see that in action. And because the coup, coup proxy was pretty fast, right? That, yeah. That was instantaneous almost. But AWS Node is a, is a little more, um, I guess, a higher maintenance of a service, let's say. So you can't just kill it all and, and let the new ones come up. So it's cool yeah, to see Yeah, totally. This. Yeah. Okay, we're uh, continuing to kill off AWS Node. I'm noticing Core DNS hasn't uh, died away yet, and I don't know. We'll check on that next. I don't know if it's just waiting until AWS Node is completely done, or uh, if it's if I maybe messed up that command. Interesting. There's been enough history scroll by that I don't think I can scroll up and look at my command to see if I messed it up. But as soon as AWS node is finished, if it if core DNS isn't the next thing that we see die, then I'll try the command again. Let's check without the watch. Yeah. 
Nice. Looks like we're on our last AWS node. Yep. All right. So it's up. I don't see a core DNS rotation yet. So let's check that. Update core DNS. Or was it up, up to date already? Oh, see, okay. It was already up to date. So I just totally flew by that and missed that, that fact. So we're all good there. We're ready to move on to the next step. Okay, so what we've done now is we have our updated daemon sets on our 115 nodes. But what we really want is to have new nodes also, because along with 115, uh, you know, going to 116, we have new um, AMIs. So we want to make sure that we rotate those in too. Okay, this to me is the fun part. So I man, I love managing. Uh, my cluster using the config file method in uh, EKS control. And I have a config file here, test upgrade YAML. So real quick, let's run over, run through the config file again. And um, I have name of the cluster, test upgrade, region that it's in, US East 2. Version is is set for 115, but I just updated that, right? So I want to make sure to correct that in case I ever have to recreate this cluster. Now it's version 116. And then I have a managed node group here. Well, what I'm actually trying to do is build a new managed node group. So my process is going to be to create additional nodes and then uh, delete the old nodes eventually. So I have a node group that I've named 115. Guess what I'm going to name my new node group? 116. Right? Pretty, pretty simple. Everything else stays the same. Add-on policies, desired capacity, all that good stuff. I'm going to write quit. And now... Uh, I'm in a, I'm going to EKS control create node group. Let's look at the help for this real quick. And there's a lot of help. There's a lot of stuff here, uh, but I pass in um, node group, then I think cluster and name or I can pass in a file. So dash F test upgrade dot YAML. Now what's going to happen here is it's going to look at the config file and it's going to look at the node groups that already exist. And it's going to see there's a, a node group that doesn't exist yet. And it's going to go ahead and create it for me. So one existing node group uh, will be excluded. It exists already. And then one node group, where does it say it? Wait, uh, two sequential tasks, I see. Node yeah. group 116. Fix cluster compatibility and then uh, create node group 116. Cool. So deploying stack. Let's go back and look at CloudFormation again. And here's our new node group coming up. If we expand this, or click into it, you'll see uh, test upgrade node group 116. Contrast that with test upgrade node group 115. So that's the old set of nodes. This is the new set of nodes. Sweet. And it's it's um, it's nice to to see that cloud formation is to to talk about the cloud formation piece because when you think about this, we're declaring our uh, our state of our cluster. And, and, the, the, and this could get pretty big and hefty. And it's nice to know that a lot of this state is stored in cloud formation. So, you know, if, if you were curious to see who did what or what was changed, you can always look in cloud formation to, to see the state of these resources. Nice. Yeah, exactly. You can always uh, come and look at cloud formation and figure out what have I built, what exists, and all that good stuff. Um, so clusters coming up or the node group is coming up what do you think the next steps will be 
Is that a question for me? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, as far from an automated perspective, or well, just logically speaking, we have we have our work. It's running. We're still serving out the traffic. Let's go make sure that's still the case. Um, yeah. So, uh, but we're you know we're bringing up new nodes. We have our new control plane. That part's done. We have our old nodes hosting our hosting our applications right now. We're bringing up new nodes right alongside. Those are going to attach to the control plane. So really, the next logical thing would be move the work over. Yeah. Reschedule. I want to get yeah. those 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 containers, those pods that are running on the old nodes. We want to move those over to the new nodes. Exactly. So there's a command. There's a Kubernetes API call uh, that's called Cordon. And what that does is it marks the node as as don't take any new jobs. Don't take any new assignments. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to cordon and then drain all three of our old nodes. And what that's going to accomplish is it's going to, the, the cordon part says, don't take any new jobs. The drain part says, evict any running tasks and make them move elsewhere, make them get rescheduled. And since all the old nodes are now no longer el eligible to be scheduled, then uh, everything's going to move over to our new nodes. So cordon and drain, then once we've done that, all of our work has moved over, we'll then um, delete the old nodes. OK. So our node groups are up. Uh, let's just have a check real quick get nodes yep we have six now and you'll see three of them are 115 and three of them are 116 nice all right let's figure out how do we cordon and drain so let's uh eks control first eks control uh drain So there is a drain node group, and that will take care of coordinating and draining the node group all at once. If you wanted to, if you had like uber sensitive uh, work and you wanted to be extra careful, you could cordon slowly and then drain one by one. For this, I'm just going to go ahead and drain uh, the whole thing all at the same time. So I'm going to EKS control. Uh, drain node group cluster is test upgrade. Then um, the name of the node group to drain is EKS control test upgrade. Then I think I had node group in there twice because I put the word node group in the name of the node group. And I think it does that by default. And then 1 15, because that's the 115 node group. We'll drain one node group. It looks like you didn't find it. Is the name right? Uh, let's see. EKS control get node groups cluster test upgrade. Oh, OK, maybe I don't need all this other stuff. Let's try this. Nice. Cool. So it's all drained. Uh, if we get pods. Not cube system. All right, cube control get pods. Well, we see that all of these pods have now only been running for 17 seconds. So we missed them actually like uh, dying and getting restarted. Uh, but let's go over here and we'll just check real quick. Hey, hey, 
our stuff is still running. I didn't log like the IP addresses or anything to see what those were, but they're different now, suffice it to say, because we're running on different nodes. So last thing um, is to delete the node group. Now there's a couple of ways to do that. One is to, there's, there's an EKS control way of deleting a node group. But again, I really like keeping that config file current. So in my testupgrade.yaml, the way I like to do this is to delete this from the config file, right quit. And now I can EKS control delete node group and then specify dash dash only missing from the file test upgrade. So that way I know I'm always applying the contents of the file and I'm cleaning out anything that uh, isn't there. And again, uh, it shows me the plan. The plan would delete one node group, node group 115, approve. And now it has initiated a delete. Now, by the way, that appears to happen nearly instant, instantly, but actually it just sent the delete to CloudFormation. So you see delete in progress. And really CloudFormation is working in the background to clean that up. So it'll be gone in a few minutes, but, it, but for the next few seconds, get nodes would still show us the nodes. Notice, by the way, scheduling disabled. That's the cordon feature. So the nodes are otherwise considered healthy, ready, but scheduling is disabled means don't take any new work. And then because we're deleting them, they're about to go away. And, you know, in regards to that config file, I think it's fair to say you want to store that in version control, right? Yeah, I so this this is just touching on the edge of uh, a GitOps approach, but yeah, you could totally store this in version control, and then uh, always have that historical perspective of what has changed. You know, what uh, the, the cluster is different today than it was yesterday. Did something change? And you could simply go look at Git and look and see. You know, did this file change? And if you're always applying changes from the file, then you should always be tracking, you know, everything that has changed about this particular cluster. Yeah, and we, we have a, a question that just came in the chat. Really good question, actually. So uh, the question is, what benefit does EKS bring over ECS? And um, if you'd be inclined to mention the differences Fargate brings as well, that would be appreciated. That was from yeah. Less Than Jake 328. Sweet. Uh, okay, let's start with Fargate. I think that's probably the easiest thing to illustrate since we just kind of walked through uh, rotating node groups. Um, imagine if the, if these if this work was actually happening on Fargate. What we would what we wouldn't have to worry about is updating AWS node, Cube proxy, and Core DNS. That part would just get handled for us in the background. And then as far as uh, drain, coordinating and draining nodes and, and deleting old nodes and replacing them with new nodes, we wouldn't have to do that either. So the net, our work would just continue to run. And then on our next deploy, if there was any type of, because we're not just going to interrupt your containers, uh, but the next time there you know, is a failure and your container crashes, or if you deploy your next version of the application or something like that, um, then in that circumstance, we would, we would bring up your new container on the latest version that matches your control plane. So um, you would get all the 116 uh, stuff running alongside it. Um, so that's, that's Fargate. It would just simplify the rest of this process even more. Now, as far as the difference in, you know, ECS versus EKS, one of the things that I love to ask when I'm talking to customers is, um, what version of ECS are you using? And it, most of the time they just kind of sit back and they think, and they're like, why don't I know this? I should know this. And, and 
then I, you know, let them off the hook. There are no versions. Um, ECS just up, it keeps itself updated in the background. There isn't any need to understand or know what version you're running on or anything like that. Now there are updates to the ECS agent. So just like we updated, um, you know, AWS node and, and Kubelet, we would have to update the ECS agent as well. Uh, but we can do that by rolling in new AMIs and, and stuff like that. And we can, just like we did here, we can manage the cutover of the data plane um, if we're not using Fargate and get all the new stuff because we're just using whatever AMI, you know, is being provided from the ECS uh, service team. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, and we did... Um... I'm trying to remember if it was yesterday or the day before, but we did actually talk about so that there's uh, these sessions are all recorded, so you can access the videos after. We Brent, at, at, whether it was yesterday or the day before, you did talk about managed nodes groups uh, versus managing your own node groups, for your own instances, and then Fargate. So we do dive into that a little bit, um, yeah, deeper. One of the previous days. Yeah, exactly. And I think we also do kind of talk a little bit about the difference in, differences in ECS and EKS just more broadly when, when it comes to, um, you know, picking your orchestrator. But really high level to answer that again, if you're all in on AWS and your workload is something that matches up with ECS, it's, you know, it's ephemeral, uh, it's... Uh, perhaps an API or something really simple, uh, using uh, ECS and using Fargate is an amazing combination. If you need incredibly high scale or you think you need to burst to, uh, to a size that you know, is, is really difficult to, to achieve on Kubernetes, then ECS can definitely get you there. ECS is massively scalable and uh, you know, Customers run hundreds of thousands of containers on ECS every single day. Um, so those are reasons uh, that, you know, you might pick one over the other, but otherwise they both do very, very similar things. So if you're operating at an average scale and you're operating average workloads, um, pick whatever you think is going to fit your work style better. Um, if you are, you know, very much into tweaking and, and honing and, and uh, you know, tuning knobs and that sort of thing, EKS uh, gives you that kind of functionality. There's all kinds of, of settings that you can tweak and, and adjustments you can make. Um, ECS is a lot more for the, for the operator that just wants to have, you know, almost a hands-off experience. You know, just do it for me and do it the best way that you know how to do it. Um, ECS is definitely uh, there for, for that kind of operator. And it can do some cool things like, uh, you know, when we roll out a new feature like service discovery, um, it, that's literally a checkbox. And all of a sudden you have service discovery. Whereas, you know, doing it in Kubernetes or in EKS, it's going to be now service discovery is not a great example because that's also pretty easy, but rolling out your own custom service discovery might be still pretty difficult. So customization, there's a lot of customization you can do in the Kubernetes space. Um, ease of uh, added features, lots of easy features get added every single day using ECS. So it's definitely uh, worth exploring both. Yeah, and I, I just want one other piece to ECS is I just love the, the when you when a new feature comes out, you just it, that's it's there. Like if it's a cluster level feature, you inherently get that. You don't have to upgrade to the latest version of ECS to to get that. It's just there. And with Fargate, there's the concept of platform versions, but you can point your platform version to latest if you want to be bleeding edge or and, and that's just another example, but to upgrade to the latest version of Fargate on ECS, it's just, you know, here's my, uh, here's the platform version I want to use. That's it. Yeah. So it's awesome. Yeah. So either way, both, I would say really great 
tools. It just depends on the operators and what you're comfortable with, what you like to use. You know, th there's options. Exactly. There is another question it looks like. So cool. I didn't even get a chance to read it yet. So, um, so it says, um, we are, we're, so we're using cops at the moment and thinking of migrating our workloads to EKS. Is there a preferred way to do it? What are the pros and cons? And that comes from gen kids. So uh, there's a lot, you're going to get a lot of philosophical, uh, answers from me here. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this, but one of the things that I love is um, using the GitOps approach for managing workloads on Kubernetes. And this is a great example of, of why that is so handy. Um, GitOps, you basically define all the workloads in a Git repo, and then you point one or more clusters at it. Um, so if you have three, five, seven, ten clusters, they can all be looking at the same repo. They can all grab the same work and they can all start doing the same work, deploy the same versions of the same applications and all that stuff. So it's a great way to manage multiple to many clusters. The reason I bring it up here is because migrating from a COPS managed cluster to EKS would be as simple as bring up the EKS cluster and then point it at your GitOps repo. And all of a sudden, all the same work gets you know, launched onto your EKS cluster and it just starts running. And at that point, then any ingress or whatever that you need uh, that is going into your cluster, you just shift traffic over and, um, and you're happy. If it's stateless, uh, truly stateless, then you can even mix in, uh, you know, have some of your traffic going to one, your old ALB and some traffic going to a new ALB and then like gradually kind of, if you wanted to do that. But usually that's not even necessary. Just cut traffic from A to B. It's very much like a blue green for an entire cluster. And then uh, once you're happy, uh, shut off the COPS cluster and um, you're good to go. So check that out. There's some other like backup solutions, Sonobui, and I can't remember some of the others lately that I've run across, where you can basically say like, make cluster B look exactly like cluster A, and you know, in effect, do a backup of your cluster and have everything running in sync. You don't need that if you're doing if you're doing GitOps. So definitely check out. Uh, you know, the GitOps approach for managing clusters. Yeah, great feedback. Cool. Any other questions? That's all we have here. You know, one thing I was thinking of is when you were, um, we have about 10 minutes left here, but when cool. you were uh, updating, you know, via the YAML file with EKS control, what would happen if, if, you upgraded via the command line to 116, but your YAML was 115. And I, I was just thinking about this. What would that Yeah. Be? So the YAML is really going to come into play when I want to build, rebuild this cluster. So in theory, that should never happen. You know, if I accidentally were to delete the cluster, then that would be bad, right? So, um, you always plan for the worst, though. So that's why I, will, I always try and keep that part, that section of the YAML updated anyway, because I'm going to be having a, if if I'm if I'm leaning on that, I'm going to be having a terrible day. So missing the fact that I didn't update, keep that part updated, is going to be the last thing on my mind. So I always want to keep it updated when times are good, because if I'm ever calling on that, it's because times are bad. And I don't want to make things even worse. You know, I mentioned the backwards compatibility. In this particular circumstance, going from 115 to 116, what would happen is if I accidentally destroyed my cluster and I had to get everything back, I would use that file. I would, you know, recreate the cluster and it would come back up at 115. And that's not that terrible. 
but imagine if I if it's been you know a year and now it's been four versions that I haven't kept updated and now I have to go through the upgrade process you know once the cluster does come back up I have to upgrade it you know one two three four more times to get it back to where it was it's just much easier to just start you know with with the latest with the the most current situation so keeping that updated is is really handy yeah yeah so i wonder um you know in the last last few minutes here if there's anything any parting words or you know i mean we've we've so we're two weeks in now last week we did ecs workshop this week we did EKS workshop. I guess, you know, as we progress with, you know, containers from the couch, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, good call. So EKS is a huge topic. EKS workshop is full, chock full of a ton of information. And we really only scratched the surface. We just got started with deploying our applications. So, uh, you know, definitely get familiar with that, that type of material, but then move on, you know, like go to some of the additional chapters and you can hop around in EKS workshop and find things that, uh, you know, that apply uh, to you and to your environment. Like there's a machine learning chapter, but if you're not doing machine learning, you don't necessarily need to look at that chapter. So the chapters aren't linear you can hop around and you can do uh, different parts and pieces of them. And uh, the only thing that you might need to make sure of is that you have your cluster, you know, named the way that it's expected to be named in the workshop and that you've installed Helm. I think that's probably the most common prerequisite that other chapters will end up having. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And I'll, I'll tell you from, my experience, you know, if I'm doing something in EKS, I'm building a demo or I'm working on something. If I have a question, I don't even go to the docs first. I don't go to like I go to EKS workshop first because I know there's a good chance that someone's written a chapter on this and solved this problem for me. So it's really awesome as a reference point. Yeah. And also, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but it's open source. I mean, I know you know this. I don't know if everyone else out there knows this. Um, so if you feel very strongly that there's some material that we've missed or that we, you want added to the workshop, uh, you can definitely, you can either click on GitHub project here and it'll take you to our GitHub project. There it is. There it comes. Okay. So it'll take you to, wow, GitHub looks different today. Are you just seeing this update now? Yeah. I haven't looked at GitHub in a couple days. It's pretty. They updated the nice. icons. It's really nice. Nice. Awesome. Uh, well, surprise for me. Um, but yeah, so this is our GitHub page. And you can see some instructions on how to get started and, and stuff like that. In addition, if you just think that, you know what, there's a typo here and I need to fix this because it's bugging me. Um, any and all of these pages you can actually edit and submit a pull request. So for example, if I wanted to edit this page, I can click in the upper right, edit this page. And if you weren't logged in as me, because I can directly edit this page, so it just opened me up to the editor. But if you were logged in as you, then uh, it would actually open, it would fork this into your own GitHub account and then open it up into your editor and then walk you through doing a pull request. Uh, back to the upstream project. So this is all just markdown. It's really, really simple. Um, so it's super easy to uh, to edit in place, and especially if you're talking about fixing, um, you know, a typo. And what's cool is over the course of the, this existence, um, we've actually had a ton of contributors. And I'm looking to see real quick if I can find in this new layout, yeah, 153 contributors, um, you know, have pushed at least one commit to EKS Workshop. They're not all AWS people. Uh, some, plenty are for sure. But yeah, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's a whole bunch of people that are just from the community. They just have one commit. Um, some commits are like a whole chapters, and some commits are uh, typo fixes. 
So we definitely appreciate our contributors and uh, you're welcome to, you know, add on. You're welcome to enhance the workshop however you find you can. Cool. I see uh, another question. How does AWS handle EKS updates if there's a zero day? Um, thinking back to Docker Run C about a year ago and so on. Well, there's a couple of things that we do. I mean, obviously every situation is going to be unique. Um, so we're doing our best to prevent uh, you know, us rolling out something that uh, would have a zero day. One of the things that we do is we don't launch um, you know, the next version of the service the day it's released. Um, so we kind of, uh, we do our own extensive testing. The EKS team is constantly uh, you know, looking at, at future releases and, and figuring out, you know, is this production worthy? Is this something we're ready to support and, and all that stuff? And, and we've definitely held uh, releases in the past because we weren't comfortable with them from a security perspective. And I can't get into details, but that's that's definitely happened already. So we want to you know continue to do that, continue to be uh, a little bit conservative when it comes to uh, our release schedule and our releases. And we'll release when we're when we're super happy uh, with you know with the current state of things. Now that said, if we have to roll out an update, um, we already uh, plan for the possibility of doing minor patches. So on the control plane, we'll patch the control plane in the background without you having to worry about anything. We'll just do it for you. So 116, I didn't even look at the minor version of, of the cluster. Um, let's see if it even says, doesn't say, uh, so I don't know what the minor version is, but it's entirely possible that it's been patched uh, and I never even realized it. Then when it comes to the, the nodes, you'll see that what we rolled out is 116.8. And what we had when we had the 115 nodes was 115.11. Well, I can tell you for sure that three months ago when 115 uh, or whenever 115 was released, I don't think it was released with dot 11. So we've iterated and uh, you know, continued to bake AMIs and release new minor uh, patch versions. And anytime you're using EKS control, and you're especially when you're using the managed node groups, you're going to get whatever the latest uh, iteration or the latest patch of that particular AMI happens to be. So we try and make it as easy as possible for you to get updates. Um, and in fact, you know, we'll do the updating for you whenever we can. Nice. So I think we've, we've hit our, hit our time, uh, for, for today and this week. So we won't be on tomorrow. Right. Um, but schedule wise, are we, are we on next week? Are we, are we uh, yeah, we're going to be on next week, Monday through Thursday. Cool. So, uh, we'll see you again next week and we're just going to be talking about other container related stuff. Uh, we'll be going over more of EKS Workshop. We're going to ho start hopping around the chapters, um, and we're just going to cover some cool and interesting topics. Awesome. And if you guys, if you folks have any questions, um, our, our Twitter handles are below. Please feel free to reach out. But thank you so much, and we will, we will see you next week. Have cool. a great weekend. See ya.